In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. Oh, I forgot to take the, the this off the screen. Here we are. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Sublation Media viewers and magazine readers to the Sublation Magazine show. This is Sublation Media's weekly live stream in which we speak with authors and discuss some of the issues of the day and their relevance for the left. I'm Douglas Lane. And I'm Ashley Frawley. Ashley Frawley is back two weeks in a row. We're, she's going to be back all the time. Today, we are going to discuss her, her debate with Sophie Lewis on the question of the abolition of the family and talk to Ollie Mould. I'm thinking that's how you say his last name, although if it isn't, then he'll correct me, uh, about his books on creativity and ethics. His books are Against Creativity and Seven Ethics Against Capitalism. He also recently wrote for Sublation Magazine. He did uh, an essay about the death of the queen and the meaning of uh, the monarchy. Um, before we begin, I'd like to ask you all to like and subscribe and hit the bell, which is mandatory for me to ask that. Also, make sure you keep up to date with Sublation Magazine's latest content by following us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, our first book, Todd McGowan's Enjoyment Right and Left, is available for pre-order, not just in the United States now, but internationally on our website. And I think you can find it on Amazon and other vendors as well. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. We just introduced annual memberships. Uh, if you sign up as an annual Patreon supporter, you get a discount so that, that the first two months are free. And links are in the description. So if you feel inclined, you can also drop us a super chat. Um, we will try to keep track of that and perhaps even answer a few questions towards the end of this stream. Uh, but uh, Ashley, you are very busy. You um, are busy um, in a very typical way, uh, just jumping from one stream to another right you, you just had a a, a a debate that was virtual um tell me yeah. a little bit about that what happened well yeah well i've not just been jumping around uh virtually but also physically i was also in london doing some debates and i I've, I've just come back i just got off the train and i did another debate and now i'm here so nice. i was debating autonomy who will defend autonomy today mm -hmm. and uh on saturday and then i just had a debate with um Polly Toynbee, as I just said, and uh, sorry, Polly Toynbee and Sophie uh, Lewis, as yeah. you just said, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, abolition of the family and um, also about the idea of like hierarchy uh, that is reproduced within the family and privileges that are passed down through generations. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a pretty frustrating debate, I have to say. <laughs> Because uh, I feel like the host probably just didn't understand what I was saying. <laughs> and I who, just, I kept. Who was hosting this? Not just like who was the actual host, but what was, who, what organization was putting this together? Uh, Institute of Arts and Ideas, I think I, I said mm -hmm. that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so I was trying to, to say like, it's, it's, but this is a very bad kind of thing to lead with. I mean, you, you just go on YouTube and you search like Marx and abolition of the family. And it's a bunch of right wingers being like, communists want to take your babies. You know? mm -hmm. it's like pretty much the worst politics. And this is not a new thing. It's not like specific to YouTube. But if you go back to the 19th century, utopian socialists, long before Marx and Engels flirted with the idea of family abolition, Utopian socialists, um, you know, the Owenites and so on, and, um, you know, others, they were all about family abolition, free love. Every time that there was some kind of revolutionary movement, this would be on the table in some way. And it was extremely alienating to the working class. I mentioned the Owenites, part of the reason why they were, uh, this group of utopian socialists, part of the reason why they were alienated from uh, workers and their movement kind of floundered was because of their position on the family. At that time, workers were fighting for recognition of their families, um, mm -hmm. for certain rights for their families, um, but they, they fought hard for that. Uh, and you had this group saying, oh, you shouldn't even want this. And this is the same kind of thing that's going on right now, where capitalism itself, in many ways, is abolishing the family, making it very, very difficult to raise a family. Um, neoliberalism, in spite of paying lip service to the family, um, blames the family for a huge range of issues and therefore is constantly governments, 
you know, left and right have constantly been attempting to go into the family to try and change people's choices and behaviors because they're just absolutely convinced that the family is the site of where everything goes wrong. Um, and so, you know, if you, this is another example of one of those things where, you know, left wingers will be like, yeah, the us will be like, this is socialism. And yeah. right wingers will be like, hey, this is socialism. <laughs> but it's neither of those things. It is the ideology of capitalism in decline, they, like deflecting its problems onto individuals and deflecting problems onto families uh, and also making it very difficult to raise a family. So what was the, the topic you know, that was being debated as it was officially stated. Um, what were you, you, you know, usually in a debate, like one person takes one position on a, a statement and another person takes the other position. So was it, you know, a abolition of the family pro and con? Was that basically? No, it's not that, that kind of debate. I think it's a little old fashioned dog. I don't <laughs> think anybody does that anymore. Uh, no, don't, so that I know someone does. I've seen it online. Anyway, well, <laughs> Well, no, so okay. there's like a, a general kind of theme that ran through everything, which was about is is um, is the family inevitable and the hierarchies that are reproduced within families is that inevitable and should we? I'm just paraphrasing off the top of my head. I don't have it in front of me, but should we um, like do away with privileges that are passed down through the generations? That was the major overarching theme. Mm. But then within that, you know, it was questions of you know all sorts of um, themes came up around um you know is is the family experienced mostly positively by people um will family structures change as time goes on you know will at one point you know in human history is it is it conceivable that the nuclear family will no longer be uh will be a thing of the past you know th these are questions that came up well i mean you at the outset stated that you thought leading with the idea of the abolition of the family was bad politics in terms of like messaging or PR. But there's another mm -hmm. side to the question, which is like internally amongst already committed socialists, how should we understand the family? And I think that's the kind of conversation that I'm more interested in because, um, you know, we've got 26 people watching right now and I'm assuming they're all just absolutely committed socialists. So people who tune in for the, for the live stream at the start. So, um, like just to play devil's advocate, um, the abolition of the family seems like it is a, it is both being accomplished by capitalism and will be realized by the creation of a of communist society. That we that to aim at the abolition of the family and to aim at communism are not really in a, a oppositional goals. Um, would you First of all, I don't know why you would want to abolish the family now when it's something that most people want. Now, when you change society, mm -hmm. you will probably change the way that people organize themselves into family units. I mean, society has massively changed now, and that has changed the way that women relate to children, has changed um, where childcare takes place for a lot of people you know we have a deep some countries have a familialization of childcare where it's expected that it's taken care of in the home and others have defamilialized it and one of the big movements within feminism for a very long time was that childcare should be outside of the home to give women the freedom to be able to make choices do what they want to do um and you know that's not the same thing as saying abolish the family I, I, I think this is, yeah, it's bad messaging. It's also not desirable and it's utopian. And this is why the utopian socialists were obsessed with it because they were trying to create these perfect societies that would be, well, for them, most in tune with some unchanging human nature. Now, I'm not saying that anybody's doing that now, but to construct these utopian societies is, I think, a pointless exercise because we don't know how society will change and we don't know, therefore, what our needs will be in terms of childcare. Um, and there are certain things that we can say we would like not to happen, certainly, like nobody wants to grow up in uh, situations of terrible insecurity um, and instability and this sort of thing. And no, I think the incredible pressure that's heaped on families, you know, you there's so much more that families are expected to do now 
you know, you're responsible mm. for supposedly sp- responsible for a huge range of social problems. When things go wrong, people go, it's the family, it's the parents. They're not doing this. They're not speaking enough to their children. They're not reading them books. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not. And so you're projecting all these problems onto families, which makes it much more difficult, the job of being a parent, much more difficult and intensive. Um, but you're doing that alone. Uh, you have so much more expectations are now on the family, but you also mm. are doing this without, you know, extended families, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. which makes it very difficult. And one would hope <laughs> that uh, that maybe that might go away. Be that, I think that's a worthwhile thing. I think it's probably achievable within capitalism if we can like calm down and stop blaming every problem that comes up on how parents raise their children. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I just think it's, it's, first of all, it's a misunderstanding of why we have social problems. And uh, second of all, it's alienating. Yeah, well, what you just mentioned is that the pressure on the private family is getting is more and more intense all the time. And um, the usual conception of the family in the, you know, let's say in the West or even more in the uh, cosmopolitan left is this sort of patriarchal nuclear family where uh, the mother stays at home and takes care of the children and takes care of the household. And the uh, father goes out into the world and works and is a breadwinner. And that, and that is a unit rather than the other conception of the family you might have, which is an, an extended family where domestic work and public work is, are blended. And, and there's an extended family and there's a more of a <clears throat> enmeshment in a community. Um, but this development of the nuclear family arose as the, the demands for uh, extending the realm of capitalism intensified. After World War II, there was a move away from rural life and farming, and more and more people were being pushed into the cities to work in, 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 in industries rather than, you know, on, on family farms. And um, so the rise of the nuclear family... Uh, as the kind of family that defined the term um, came with changes in capitalism. And I think today the focus on the family uh, has to do with another coming change in our, in the way capitalism is functioning. We're kind of entering into or have been in a post neoliberal era since maybe 2008, certainly since 2016. And the role that the family is going to play in society uh, needs to be altered to meet new kinds of conditions. And I think the, whereas in the, this is something that we talked about before we started the stream, but I think whereas under neoliberalism, this private nuclear family was privileged, at least by some parts of society, because it was a good unit from which, you know, entrepreneurialism and self-expression and, uh, could be launched. Um, now the need for uh, ties, to, stronger ties to at least the nation, if not to the community, um, is arising, and uh, so there's a desire to extend the power of the nation state, um, limit the powers of the individuals and and of families, um, in response to that. Uh, so I feel like the that, uh, you know, the death of neoliberalism might actually be part of the reason why we're compelled to put forward this demand for the abolition of the family right now. Mm. So essentially you're agreeing that this is not actually a challenge to capitalism. It is an ideological expression of something that's happening within capitalism. Well, if it's if as an immediate demand, certainly, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah, I, I think so too. But I think also you have to understand like the... Um, the sort of neoliberal approach to the family, which is to go in and kind of intervene in families and try to make them, you know, shore them up to make the right choices and so on. This is something that has a long history. Like it goes back, well, long, <laughs> it goes back at least to the early 1990s. You know, it was very powerful in Clinton. Uh, in the Clinton yeah, that's so long ago. The 90s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a child, so it was. Yeah. At least I can say that at this point. But anyways, um, this, you know, exalting the family, people often think like, oh, why would they want to 
destroy it if they ideologically anyway if they when they talk about the family they talk about it as being so important and these things actually go together because saying that it's important is also locating the source of blame on the family because if everything comes out of the family entrepreneurship and so on a failure of entrepreneurship is also the fault of the family mm. so then this this is why people misunderstand neoliberalism they think it's like oh you know the state like give makes you a perfect neoliberal autonomous subject and then it just leaves and leaves you to your own devices that's not true um it goes in and it 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 has to kind of um teach you how to be the right neoliberal subject and you to constantly be like looking around for guidance and so on because they don't trust you to make the right choices why because we have persisting problems we have persistent lack of entrepreneurship for example just one example or monopoly or whatever and all these things they carry on within capitalism and so the intervention doesn't work. They just become even more certain that you're fucking something up. <laughs> like you're not raising your kids properly. You're making the wrong choices. You know, there's in these neoliberal discourses, they tend to be quite obsessed with transitions and young people um, because these are the moments when people are making choices. And so they have to be there on top of you all the time. So when they're sitting there going, oh, the family is so important, what they're really saying is the family is that if the family is a source of where things go right, it's also the source of where things go wrong. So it becomes this, this place where people can project the problems of capitalism. And they do this also with individuals, you know, you're all messed up in your head and you, you know, we all could use a little bit of mindfulness. We're all walking through our lives on autopilot, you know? And so they, that what they're, what they're saying is that, you know, there's something wrong with you. So we need to intervene in your life constantly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But anyway, so, I think that that's the thing that people misunderstand. Neoliberalism doesn't leave you alone. Yeah. Listen, we've got alone. Ollie waiting in the back room, but before I bring him onto the screen, I want to ask you one last question, which is what you said at the outset that you didn't feel as though the, when you were in this debate that it was particularly well received or maybe that it wasn't received at all. Like you weren't being understood. You weren't being allowed to speak. <laughs> um, we, we should put a link to it if it's online already it's not that uh, i wasn't being allowed to speak it's that i talked too much and the guy was like that's enough <laughs> <laughs> well in a good zizekian tradition there but um uh why do you think it is so difficult for for some aspects of the left to hear a more complicated story about the role that the family is playing why do we i don't know i family? feel like a lot of the left has been kind of as i said before like they they mistake certain developments for socialism that are actually an ideological reflection of capitalism in decline so they'll be like oh anti-consumerism that's socialism and they don't realize that you know you need your you know as a worker you need to not be desirous you need to you know save and not want things and you have to accept lower wages you want the workers of other countries to be consumers, right? So that you just play into the the hands of, of well, the ideology of capitalism, I suppose. Um, and I think a lot of these things, uh, like um, we think, oh, well, the right wing is on about the family, so ergo, we must abolish the family. We just sort of like reject things, I think. And also I think there's a little bit of neoliberal capture on the part of the left where um, it's a lot of people are kind of suspicious of the working class and they, see themselves, they see the path to freedom as the management of the working class, that there's the, the, the real problem is that there's a barrier between the supposedly revolutionary subject and the world as it could be. We have to go to this subject, fix them, and then somehow we will move toward the world as it could be. And therefore you go into their families, you go into education, it becomes a kind of social engineering project. Instead of a project in actually understanding the world <laughs> and seeing therefore what could be that grows out of the world. Instead, we see the problem is in here rather than out there. And I think that's become really hegemonic on the left. Well, one thing is um, about our, our guest, I'm just about to bring on the screen, is that his prescriptions aren't really aimed at the working class. It seems to me they're aimed at the left. He's written two books. One is um, that, that I know of, I'm probably written more, but uh, Against Creativity and Seven Ethics Against Capitalism. Let's bring Ollie on now. <clears throat> Ollie. Welcome to Supplation Magazine show. Thanks for coming on. Right as I bring you on, he's, he's frozen. Um, but there he is. And uh, in a moment, I'm sure he'll break through again. Hi, Ollie. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you just froze for a Brilliant. second there. So um, 
Ollie, it's Ollie Mold, is that right? Or how do I say your last name? Yeah, that's fine. Ollie Mold, it's it's a dialect that can be, you know, it's a name that can be said in any dialect. It's fine. Okay, okay. How would you say it, though? Just, just uh, I say Ollie Mold, but... Um, well, see, now I, I don't even hear the difference. That's how American I am. So, um, uh, Ollie, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, I, I've uh, written some questions that I, you know, have prepared for you in advance, but before we dive into talking about your book, um, what are your thoughts? Are you, I, 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 if you've been listening during this beginning, do you do you think how where do you stand in in relationship to the abolition of the family? If you dare to tread into this terrain, I have been listening, and it's been a really fascinating discussion. Um, I do tread into this terrain a little bit in the book, the, the Seven Ethics Against Capitalism book, uh, mm -hmm. which I guess we'll go on to talk about. But uh, there's a chapter on love. And in it, um, I'm talking about the different ways in which love has been narrated and articulated. Uh, one of which, or the one that I focus on is, is like, a, uh, there's a particular kind of Greek understanding of agape love, which is a sort of unconditional love, which is borrowed from religious discourses. However, one of the other sort of ways in which love is narrated from the Greek anyway, is uh, storge, which is related to, uh, they call it familial love or family love, uh, it translate the translations through bloodlines and you know the, the mother daughter father son kind of love um i guess in 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 the contemporary condition you could translate that into the institutions of the family which we've been discussing mm -hmm. uh but i it's funny when you've been chatting it's it we have been you have been talking about the institutions of the family and i think you're absolutely right that a lot of the problems of society are often pinned onto the family particularly in this country with, uh, you know, fascist conservatism, which tried to rear its ugly head in the last couple of weeks. It's kind of been knocked back a bit, I guess. But uh, it's, um, you know, the, the, there are no such thing as society. It's just individuals and families, right? That's a famous, mm -hmm. that's a famous mm -hmm. phrase. And so the family has always been considered an incredibly important building block of, of the conservative neoliberal society. Mm -hmm. However, I think that the institutions that you've been talking about, there's a difference between that and the... I guess the sort of loving relationships which families create. I'm always torn. I'm always turned towards um, people who I who I've spoken to and done various amounts of research and various different hats on, who have uh, lost their families for whatever reason, but they 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 find another family through another person. So young gang kids, for example, they 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 find a a family in the gang as as kind of destructive as that might be or they someone else in a more positive way finds a, a father figure in a, in a in a somewhere outside of their nuclear biological family and these are always and so i think that there's a sense of the relationships between people which creates our understanding of the family now i think that we have to be careful not to conflate those two the institution of the family which you rightly have argued is plays a bit, sort of pivotal role uh, in both the left and the right in terms of their narratives against capitalism. But there's a sense that the, the relationships within that almost, or which construct that institution are still incredibly important. And they're still incredibly, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the people benefit from them incredibly, uh, you know, depending on who it is. I mean, it might not be their biological father or biological mother, or even someone they've lived with for 20 or 30 years. It just might be someone they meet at the boxing gym or, or wherever it might be. So I think we have to be careful not to conflate those two. I mean, they are related, obviously, but I think that we, we can talk about those kinds of articulations of the family in different ways and have different outcomes depending on, you know, which one we want to talk about. Well, right, yeah, well, but you're not, ahead, you're not socializing the person that you meet in the gym, right? You're not like, like initiating that person into a world of, of rules, norms, and values that they're unaware of, right? So the family, the reason why the family gets that kind of, is targeted so much is because it's it's seen as the place where if there are problems, that's where they get introduced and reproduced. Instead of seeing mm -hmm. them as out there, it's like, oh, well, there's something that the parents are doing because people are making bad choices, right? That's why the family gets so bound up in that. But I, I agree, like, People can have all sorts of relationships, but also mm. that relationship between the parent and the child is really different in a lot of ways because it has that weight of socialization on it. Yeah. I, I would just throw in one other point, which is that the way I think about the family is 
largely through Christopher Lash's book, A Haven in a Heartless World, which he is neither advocating for the family, but nor is he joining in for calls to abolish it, um, but rather kind of describing how the family ended up in the position in society that it is and as a haven um, in a world which uh, otherwise is alienated and alienating. So rather than mm -hmm. where you have, you can, it's the, the site where you're supposed to be able to have real human relationships based on your, in, your individual self and not based on your position within the productive forces of capitalism, say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it is set apart from the rest of society as a private space of humanity um, mm -hmm. as a haven. But because of that, it, it, it bears a, a unusual and, and usually destructive amount of pressure. Uh, it can't really hold up as an institution against those forces. And so uh, I would just think that the relationship that you might find with uh, a, a friend based on common interests like uh, boxing or something like that um, would be could could be given this position as a haven, but would probably bear up even less well against the pressures of society. You know, like, you know, mm -hmm. at least the, the family does have usually uh, a history, not only a history for the people who are alive to, and, and, you know, functioning in it, but also the stretches back generations. And so uh, I, I feel as though people want that the depth of uh, that is expressed through time and uh, the stability that is expressed through that a commitment to the family um, that I mean maybe it doesn't often hold together but I mean I, I've actually recently divorced so I know <laughs> that it doesn't often uh, bear up under the pressure but that I think is what people are longing for. Um, uh, I'll just throw that out there, but you. Respond. Yeah, no, I, I was just. I would also add just quickly. Quickly, I think there's uh, post sixty eight as well. There was. I mean, you guys have taught in universities. You'll know that in the modern university system uh, requires students to pay, and obviously that payment is clearly uh, lumbered on the family a lot of the times. And I think that was an interesting move, if you like, by post sixty eight capitalism to sort of lumber the education of our kind of next generation onto the family rather than from the state. And so any critic, any criticality is kind of slowly chipped away by the family sort of saying, no, you have to, you know, you go, you go to university to get a job, you know, you don't, don't, you know. And so there's, I think, particularly in the modern era, particularly in the UK where tuition fees are just ridiculously stupidly high, um, you know, th th there's a real sense amongst my peers and the people that teach universities in this country that, the, the the transformation of um, university students as sort of potential radicals into sort of neoliberal consumers is, is complete because it has lumbered the edu the payment of that education into the family setting and so and it br bringing with that all those those the histories and those cultures and traditions which you talked about which is you know I want you to go I want you to do well I want you to succeed I want you to get a job and get money and blah 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 so yeah from a university context I think the family has been a real has been mobilized particularly um effectively by by a kind of post-68 capitalism yeah um listen let's talk about your books um i mean we could talk about your book against creativity uh i have a couple questions for that or we could just dive into your book entitled seven ethics against capitalism uh it's i feel like you, okay You're all right first. uh I, then i will this was the, the that experiment in democracy has ended and I will just <laughs> <laughs> plunge ahead. Um, so uh, we just discussed the family. It seems as though uh, the, the, the family is both a problem and a need. Um, you, in, you've written something similar about something similar. The family is uh, this site, this ideological site, which has a, a variety of meanings and it's both a problem and, and a need. Creativity is uh, similarly something that people want, something people need. It's a, way, it's a way to discover yourself. It's a way to enter into the public realm and, and leave a mark. Um, and yet in, in your telling, creativity has been severely limited and it's taken on a particular ideological meaning. Um, and 
and I, I just want to give you a chance to, to to explain what you mean when you wrote what what were you saying when you wrote a book called Against Creativity? Yeah, so I mean, I think that it's no, um, it's you know, it's uh, it's fairly well known now that the term creativity, if you like, has kind of been completely hijacked by a, a neoliberal dogma. I mean, Richard Florida, the you know the um, the famous kind of uh, Canadian American North American urbanist, I think he works at Toronto now. He was the one who wrote the book in 2002, The Rise of the Creative Class. And from that, it's just the Pandora's box opened. And, you know, I think that it was the right book at the right time. And it meant that uh, it, cities all over the world and country, you know, national governments, regional governments, urban governments were fighting over themselves to get Richard into their, you know, into their um, seminars, talk rooms and everything else. And just, tell, you know, ask him what, what, what could they do to be more creative? And it was a real sense that, uh, it, it, it was just emperor's new clothes. And I think that's looking back, that's very, very obvious. And it was obvious to most people who were reading it at the time, to be fair. But um, even to him now, I think, 20 years later, I think he sees that that was the case. Um, but the, the, the thing is, is that the, the, the term has kind of um, lost any meaning beyond that these days. It's, it's still mobilized as a, as a vehicle for for neoliberal development, uh, particularly within urban centres. I mean, I'm an urban geographer, so I noticed it first and foremost with the creation of the creative city, um, placemaking, and all these different kinds of activities. Um, so I wanted to sort of write that book just as the sort of anti-Florida book, essentially, a sort of counter-narrative to this bullshit that was being peddled around the world. And so uh, it, it was an attempt to try and unmask it to say well this is where it's come from this is why creativity is mobilized in this way it means very specific forms of urban consumption which are off, you know these days is sort of narrativized and articulated as hipsterism or placemaking or you know um, public art so there's a there's a there's a very specific form of consumptive practices around creativity which look very similar wherever you go around the world, largely because there's only a handful of actors, Richard Florida included, who uh, sort of dictate what, this, what these cities should look like. So, yeah, I wanted to just to sort of tear down that narrative. I mean, other people had kind of done it before. Jamie Peck and other people, other geographers, um, had you know, written some very, very stinging acerbic critiques of this work. So it wasn't you know, uh, anything new in that respect, but I think it was a really uh, kind of important narrative to make. And then obviously at the time as well, Richard Florida was writing his other book, The, the Urban Crisis, in which he essentially kind of admits that he was wrong. So uh, it's slightly vindicated in some ways, but it's, um, yeah, that's what I, why I wanted to write the book. But I guess I would caveat that by saying that it's it's an, it's a socio-political critique insofar as that, because, that, Believe it or not, I, when I finished my PhD, God blimey, 15 years ago, I took a job in a sort of think tanky kind of thing. And I was working in, the, in this realm, in the sort of creative industries in London. I became just disillusioned with it very, very quickly. But it, 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 I, I, I was kind of on the inside for a bit and I could see it happening. And it was, you know, horrific in many cases. So, but it's, it's a very much a socio-political critique. Um, since the book has come out, I've spoken to a lot of artists and psychologists and other people who have a sort of slightly different understanding of creativity, uh, perhaps from, you know, from a psychological background or a neurological perspective, perhaps, uh, and also from an artistic perspective, you know, real sort of fabulous artists who are doing some work who are quite angry with the fact that I was against the art form to, to a degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was a sociopolitical critique, and I think that was an important one to make. But from that, there's, I think that there, we can begin to unpick some of the other ways in which creativity is articulated in other fields. So that's what, that's kind of what the book is there for. Um, do you know, a friend of mine said at the weekend, he works for Morgan Stanley. Uh, and he said that he walked into work and he's like, yeah, I know it's evil and everything like that. And I understand that it's evil, but I get a paycheck. But he walks into, he says they have a, a Starbucks in their offices. So he walks in there with one of his coworkers and she, and he says, hey, do you want to get Starbucks? And she says, oh, no, no, I refuse to get Starbucks. And he goes, why? He's like, there, it's an evil corporation. <laughs> this person who works for Morgan Stanley, whose job it is to, <laughs> well, move money around that involves extreme exploitation. 
do you think in a way that these kinds of um these kinds of approaches are, are like our attempts to kind of deflect away from a deeper kind of logic to capital yeah i mean i think it's um it was Zizek talks about this, isn't he, with this sort of ethical consumption and how it's sort of, it's uh, it's it's almost um, a performative critique. It's almost you, you sort of have your uh, you have your resistance kind of performed for you, uh, and I think that there's a lot of truth in that. And uh, there is a deflection technique going on here. I mean, a lot of the artists that I have spoken to have actually, you know, they they feel very very conflicted because they're often paid by urban developers, for example, to art wash a particular area. So if they, you know, this is a classic process, particularly here in, in the UK and London and specifically where developers will often use artists to sort of soften, soften the edge of the area and make it more palatable to the creative class. And all of a sudden the rent gap is such that they can then go and demolish it. So, and all these artists yeah. will often feel very, very uh, conflicted. Um, but the, the 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 sort of what they say to me is that well, you know, I, like you say, I've got a you know they've got mouths to feed, they've got families to feed, um, <laughs> and so uh, you know they what was it one person said they said that they hope that the the uh, the, the voice the, the the message that they have is heard above the noise of the inrushing capital enough just to sort of make a bit of a statement. And um, sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. Uh, and that's the sort of daily dance of of appropriation versus critique, I guess, that you know that plays out in in global cities around the world. Um, so I think people are quite conscious of this, but it's it's all, as it as it always is. It's a it's a balancing act between how you know we, we face it with climate crisis, don't we? I mean, we, we all we're all very familiar with the problems, and we all try and live a life that is climate friendly. And but you know that we only have so much energy, we only have so much kind of ability to, to go as far as we want to. And so we kind of set up base camp somewhere. We would buy an electric car and have solar panels on our roofs and you know do whatever mm -hmm. it is we can. But there's always more to be done. But we you know we kind of we make that compromise based on sort of the en energies and the efforts that we have. And I think that's the same with people like your friend who are sort of refusing to go to Starbucks. I mean I refuse Amazon. That's my that's my and Facebook. But I still use Google and I still use Apple. I mean does that make me a hypocrite? Probably, but it's, well, it's just well, things. No, you, it doesn't yeah. because you live in capitalism, right? Like the, this is the yeah. thing that the more that you're, you, you do these sorts of things this is the Zizek line, right? Like the more that you say, oh, well, I, I draw the line there. I don't do this. Mm -hmm. I eat this. I, you know, the more you're telling yourself, I'm not really a part of this. I, I have stepped outside. I, and this is my action. Um, and Zizek says, I don't want the act itself to like, I, you know, I don't want someone to tell me that within this structure, I can do these little things that make it not so bad. I want every time I buy a Starbucks coffee, five cents to go toward killing a child. <laughs> that's, what <laughs> that's, what, that's what Zizek says, because he's perverse. Um, it's just yeah. horrific. Obviously, as a mother, I, it's very hard for me to say that. But the point that he's trying to make is that at least then you're not kidding yourself that you are doing something through small acts that actually doing something about this system requires a, a it's it's not an individual thing it's not something that you can do in your daily life it's not a lifestyle that you can adopt and somehow subvert the system this is why it becomes appropriated again because then it's just sold back to you as a different lifestyle um mm -hmm. the only way forward is to understand the system see where it's going and try to overcome its contradictions. Like the, the problem that we have with climate change, for instance, isn't that not a, a sufficient number of people are not awake. The people know, but we don't act directly in relation to these, um, to these problems. We have to act through the medium of profit, you know, so we have to make it profitable, even though we may have the science and the technology to do it. We can't because it's not yet profitable to do so. So it's about trying to understand you know, the limitations of the system which we find ourselves as well. I, I want to put in another thought that on top to kind of maybe uh, not not go against you, Ashley, but to sort of add a, another layer to the to this idea. Like um, not only are we being offered solutions that are not really solutions that, is, that are well within the realm of ideology often enough from, you know, corporations like Starbucks, which say, well, they'll donate a certain amount to fair trade and 
and so on uh, every time we buy a cup of coffee. But further, if we look back on even the most radical aspects of the, the left or the ones that we can remember, um, we can see that the left's demands have historically been taken up and as capitalism transforms itself and granted in this like in a monkey's paw kind of move like oh you want this well here it is and then this is and you'd say well this isn't what i was asking for like with creativity right the creativity and self-expression um and uh, to break from conformity these were the demands of the new left uh and leading into 68 um but in retrospect we can see that the protests of of the new left may have even contributed to setting up the neoliberal order that came after. Right. And so I want to ask you about your book on seven ethics um, against capitalism today. We're in a, in, in a position of transition, I think as well. And how do we, and how did you uh, think about putting forward ethical demands for the left um, in the context of this change? Do, I mean, do, you know, uh, were you thinking about, the fact that uh, a, a demand that you make today um, against the neoliberal order might be taken up tomorrow and, and given to you, like, you, you know, like I want to be the richest man in the world and, you know, and you get all the money and then everyone else is poor and you can't buy anything with your money anyway. It's useless, that kind of move. So how did you, how did you approach writing these ethical demands? Yeah, no, I get what you mean. It's a really good question. I mean, um, it's, it is a it is a question of that because one of the key conversations that always came out of the creativity book was, well, what is to be done? What you know, how can we escape the sort of clutches of this appropriative capitalism, which mm. has become so good at um, profiting on subversive or uh, marginal voices or whatever it is? I mean, put bluntly, how do you how can you stop from selling out? I think that's kind of the question that, that really drives the book, mm. um, and. You know, I think that the the seven ethics which I outline, they're, they're sort of based on the, you know, the sort of past 20 years of just kind of grappling with these issues. And they put, boil down to, to these seven ideas. Individually, I think they are acts of resistance. But I think the idea is that together what they do is allow people to uh, enter into a kind of relationship with the status quo where they understand how it's de- what it, what it's demanding of them, and have at have at their disposal some tools to ward, in order to ward that off. That sounds quite prosaic, but I think that you know it's 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 simple things like um, you know uh, making sure that you understand your privilege, for example, or making sure that you you're doing things without uh, you know you're doing things with slowly, or you're doing things in a way which allows you to understand the. The impact that it has on the world and the, and the people around you, and clearly there's lots of uh, checks and balances to this, and there's lots of ways in which living under capitalism stops us being able to do this. And like like you said, Ashley, you know, I think that you're you can only do with you know you can only start from the position you're in, and we are all in you know neck deep in kind of capitalist relations. But I think that the book really tries to paint a picture whereby you know, that there are tools out there. You know, this is kind of the anarchist thought and the anarchist in me, I guess, is that there, there are incredibly uh, positive societies, sometimes quite local, sometimes quite fleeting, but there are really fantastic examples of people creating these alternative societies. These, this, There is no alternative. Yes, there are. There are hundreds of them if you just open your eyes and look around the world. And so it's, you know, trying to sort of think, well, what what are the sort of benefits of all that? What are the ways in which they're operating? And as I say, I picked for seven of them and thought, well, th- these are the sort of ethical positions that they, they operate under. What happens if we put them together? Does that make it stronger? My argument is yes, potentially, uh, but clearly there's lots of checks and balances. And to answer your sort of question directly about like, well, will that mean therefore that capitalism understands <laughs> what we're trying to do and then therefore disarm us as we go forward. I mean, yes, that's, that's always the problem and that's always the guise, but I don't think that, that should stop us from trying. Right. Um, well, I, I, uh, 
I, I, I want to go over a couple of the, the suggestions that you make in, in Seven Ethics Against Capitalism, but the ones I wrote down to ask you questions about uh, and sent you are, now that I'm talking to you, not the one I want to, to really <laughs> ask you about. I want to ask um, uh, about uh, slowness. Because that's the one that, to ask that. <laughs> yeah, that's the one that appeals to me. Like as someone who works uh, in, you know, uh, on an online magazine and in publishing, which publishing books is kind of slow, but but on YouTube and podcasting, the demand to put, you know, to go fast um, is constantly there. It's a constant pressure, and I feel like I'm always trading off uh, more. You know, the putting out a, a video that has the best of my ability expressed in it versus putting out a video tomorrow you know uh so how d do you mm -hmm. champion slowness why is slowness a radical demand or at least a kind and of what happens if you work at amazon and you try to champion slowness <laughs> yeah i mean obviously these are really important questions and i think that you know um the amazon one is is perhaps even more so because you know you you can't uh you you know you can't react to the system in that way because what is it like 150 boxes a minute, whatever they have to, have to do? Mm -hmm. I think what, what, to, to sort of to, to talk about slowness is to uh, really get into the um, uh, it, it's to unpack the well being narrative. And I think that the well being economy has kind of co opted that idea of slowness quite well. So I think that the ethic of slowness is to, it basically attacks the well being economy to say, look, th th you know, there are kernels of truth in that. You know, like um, meditation and all those different things are really important for self-care and for, you know, for activism and everything else. But of course, it's been completely sort of co-opted by uh, various institutions and various industries. But having said all that, you can you can uh, sort of be slow, but you it requires the other ethics around it. So like mutualism, for example, there is strength in kind of uh, slowness together. The, the well being the well being industry is all about individual slowness. You know, we see it all in the adverts all around us, and you know, it's all like, oh, you know, do this retreat, have a you know a sleeping pod in Amazon. You know, it's, it's it cuts out the the collective versions of slowness. So there, I've used things like the slow fashion movement, and I mean, obviously, these are couched in capitalist discourses, and that's again, it goes back to what you were saying. We can't escape that, but they do create various. T uh, vehicles or various kinds of technologies where we can say do you know what that is actually helping that's actually creating uh, a better environment and so um you know slowness is something which if we do it on our own i think we are sort of uh, leaning into a kind of well-being narrative which you know is problematic on many levels but i think if we do it collectively with sort of social um, slow movements a slow mm -hmm. scholarship slow fashion, slow film, uh, slow music. I use the example of John Cage's, uh, um, not the, the man of 4 minutes 33 fame. You know the guy that wrote the piece of music, which is just 4 mm -hmm. minutes and 33 of nothing? Mm -hmm. That's John Cage. You were aware of yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So John Cage, one of his pieces of work was uh, as slow as possible. And he, 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 he didn't write a time signature on this piece of work. Uh, and so some people got together, some music philosophers all got together and they said, oh, how long should it be? And I won't bore you with the details, but they plumped on 638 years. <laughs> and so at the beginning of the millennium in 2001, they, they said, right, we are going to play as slow as possible on, the, on a blockwork organ in Germany, some, some monastery in Germany for 638 years. And it started and it's been going on and on and on. And in fact, last year, it was the first ever chord change. Everyone was very, very excited. They all got together and watched <laughs> this guy kind of take apart the thing. It was fantastic. But my point is, is that this piece of music cannot ever be experienced by one individual. It can only ever be experienced intergenerationally by a collective. And I think that's just, a, for me, a really good example of that kind of collective slowness. To experience that piece of music can never be done individually. And so I think that... My my point is is that slowness is fantastic. We all need to slow down a bit, and actually, capitalism kind of works by speeding us all up a bit. Mm. But it can only be done through collective endeavor, and we get our energies from being together. So that's kind of where that. Is. Here's the thing, though. Um, 
capitalism speeds us up, not for the sake of it, but because there's an underlying logic that requires it. So I'm very sy sympathetic to what you're saying. I just finished my second book actually on the well-being stuff. Um, and this is, so there's a bit in Capital where Marx talks about how in the early stage of capitalism, the, um, the, the capitalist, he can't really consume. Every, any bit of consumption is basically stealing from his ability to be more productive. So he has to, you know, that's the miser phase of capital. You know, think of Scrooge, you know, this is the early phase of capitalism. As time goes on, capitalism starts to be able to afford to allow the capitalist a little bit of enjoyment. He begins to look around. He, th he, he, he starts to feel sorry for his previous miserly self and he desires to escape a little bit. He, he begins to despise the speed and the, the, the pressure that he has. And so he starts to look around for comfort. But Mark says um, he can never escape that. Even when he tries to become comfortable, um, it, it, the same kinds of pressures push on him. You know, every bit of comfort is taking away from the possibility of making more profit. And if you get too comfortable, you might go be a worker yourself. You might go out of business because you need to make a profit in order to reinvest to remain competitive. So there's no escape. And what's interesting is I just came across this um, this article about this uh, privileged men's group where they all come together and they talk about how hard it is to be privileged and um, how terrible it is to go to private schools. And they have they get together and they have these meditation weeks and membership is 10,000 pounds a year. Uh, another good example would be, um, oh, Huffington, Ariana Huffington. She wrote a book called, what was it? Was her book called Thrive? I can't remember now. Oh, it's hmm, weird. That probably. I, yeah. Anyways, she, she uh, writes this book that's based on the fact that she's going so quickly and everything's so quickly, uh, going so quickly, she, she forgot to slow down and enjoy. She fainted and smashed her head on the floor, and this was a wake-up call for her. So she writes this book, and she starts a company called Thrive Global. <laughs> and now if you go on to Thrive Global on Glassdoor, I invite you all to go do this, you will see that Thrive Global, a wellness company, is apparently a toxic place to work <laughs> and has <laughs> and is subject to all the same see when pleasure becomes as inevitably it does becomes escape itself becomes a business it is subject to all the same pressures um so that the end but the reason is because there is no escape either collectively or in a group there is no escape that is um through cracks in the system where you try to find a little bit of enjoyment Inevitably, this then becomes commodified and pulled back in. The solution isn't to look for a crack where you can find some space to breathe. It's to move beyond that, to, to find, I don't know, I'm mixing a ton of metaphors here, but it's to move beyond this kind of abyss, right? We're kind of stuck here and we're like, well, maybe we can meditate, you know, <laughs> maybe we can find something. And it's okay. kind of like, well, we have to look beyond it to, to kind of get out of the logic, not even to get out of the logic, but to create to understand its logic, the, what underlies like the quickness, you can't just be like, oh, well, capitalism is quick, so let's go slow. Well, why is capitalism quick? Because of co co competition, right? And you can't, you know, you can't get out of that by just you and a group of people slowing down or you and one company slowing down because you just created a new commodity, overpriced sweaters produced much more slowly. Yeah, no, I get your point. And that's absolutely right. And which is why I think in looking at the sort of ethics collectively is really important because in and of themselves, they are just simply sort of counter movements to sort of capitalism's appropriative technologies. And so, you know, you do it for long enough and yes, they will get co-opted in some way, shape or form. I guess my, my point is, and I think that one of the things that as a geographer, this is really interesting to me is that there are certain pockets of life. I mean, I guess there are like squatting, squats and eco villages and uh, other sort of anarchist communes and co you know, worker cooperatives and, other situations where slowness does actually create the the arena in which these alternative forms of life can <laughs> thrive. So I think that um, <laughs> you know it, it's about it's about having them in the collective, and you know because individually, you're right, they'll just get gobbled up by the sort of the, the counter force. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of why I try to put them together. I mean, it you know things with like, thinking about um, love and mutualism and all these different kinds of ways. They, they all help to, 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 to prop up each other's potential revolutionary or potential kind of subversive nature in order to help it kind of, uh, 
you know, just state in something which actually has a little bit of uh, longevity or has a little bit of kind of can can gather enough energy to actually make a difference to uh, to capitalist dogma or capitalist realism, to use Mark Fisher's phrase. So, but, and these things that you know they are happening, and you know, you know, there's plenty of examples around the world where it is. So, I'm, I'm perhaps a little bit more hopeful in that respect. Um, but you're right; it's it's certainly not easy in any way, shape, or form. What one thing that um, I wanted to ask you um, is: Do you think that these ethics, um, these principles that you're putting forward in your book, or even the move against creativity, would be easier to accomplish if uh, Corbynism had won? Are you are you <laughs> uh, facing a more difficult task without the uh, kind of socialism that? was trying to come up in the uh, Labour Party, uh, you know, as the wind behind your wings there? Yeah, I mean, no, I think is the answer to that, largely mm -hmm. because, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm being very specific here to 2019 and, and the UK condition, mm -hmm. insofar as had Corbyn actually managed to get into power, the attacks on him would have put, you know, put the, sorry, in 2017, sorry, when, when, you know, when he uh, nearly got into power. In, from 2017 to 2019, he was vociferously attacked in the media by a kind of coalition of the right wing of the Labour Party, the media and the Tories uh, to completely kind of um, smear him in this way. And, you know, I think that he kind of, he didn't... Um, he didn't make it difficult for them, to be honest. Let's be honest. But but had he won in 2017, I think those attacks would have been even more vociferous. I think mm -hmm. that you would have seen an absolute, you know, it would have made the the the, the CIA's attacks on Latin American socialists just look like a kind of video games. I think it would have just been he would have been utterly destroyed. I, as much as it pains me to admit it, and I don't like the way it's been happening, but I. And I, you know, I see these debates on Twitter all the time about kind of the, from leftists in the UK. But I think it's probably good that he failed because it means that the the establishment Labour, the kind of Starmer and his crew, although they are, you know, and I, they're kind of getting rid of all the left uh, socialist MPs. I think Emma Dent Code was this this afternoon was deselected. The the, the woman who um in South Kensington who who did all the, uh, did all the work around Grenfell. Um, so, but I think that my point is, is that I think that the, the, the popularity of the Corbyn's agenda, like nationalization of the railways, broadband communism, whatever the hell they called it, um, you know, uh, universal basic or some, some various sort of socialist policies, mm -hmm. they were the things that people in, probably really wanted and really kind of uh, latched onto. And so I think that they have more of a... Um, potential in a sort of more con a more sort of centrist government with a with a populist saying look these are the things we want and they're sort of dragging them over to the to the left rather than coming having Corbyn or Sanders in the US where if it, if they just suddenly appeared I think it, they, they would have been shot down very very quickly um, that's again that's a sort of utopian ideal I guess but um Maybe I'm naturally mm -hmm. optimistic about these things. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that I think that, you know, all these deselection of kind of socialist MPs is horrible and it's really, really bad. Mm -hmm. I think that what, what needs to happen is if, well, I guess when Starmer gets into power now, I saw a recent poll, it's like 35, 36 points ahead now, it's just bonkers. But, you know, th th there's at the moment, because I've done a lot of work at the moment on mutual aid groups that are around mm -hmm. the pandemic. And the government just don't want to know. They're like, you know, fuck off, dude. You know, just leave us alone. Whereas I think that a, a Labour government would be far more sympathetic to what they're trying to do. And even though their own policies might be quite harsh, I think that they'd perhaps be more open and more supportive of mutual aid. And some of the things that we've put forward from the research is actually we need a far more supportive state, actually. You mentioned about neoliberalism rolling back and everything. I think that, you know, and mutual aid is obviously something which requires absence of the state. But I think that there are certain resources that they could be made available, which aren't being made available at the moment, to enable mm -hmm. these groups. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I'm, I'm hopeful that... That sounds pretty neoliberal, though, doesn't it? 
No, 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 no. no. I, I, absence of the state, no. but we give you, you know, we go in, we give you the resource <laughs> I, to become. Well, what you but be. in the opposite direction, Ashley, not for the corporations, but for the um, mutual aid. The, the anarchists and the and then you know the libertarian anarchism. I, I get that debate, and it's an interesting mm -hmm. one, and I completely get your point. And, but th there is a, there is a boundary there, and it's and it's an obvious one insofar as that it's based in sort of community cohesion. It's as you said before, in sort of working class sensibilities. It's not about kind of having this this sort of working class object, which you have to mold into a you know a sort of revolutionary subject. It's yeah. about understanding that they're, they're already embedded in these communities, particularly here in the UK, that a lot of this mutualism already happens. A lot of this these sensibilities and these kind of intergenerational and community love, right? These families that actually come out of the house and go into neighbourhoods, they they exist, and I think that the state. At the moment, is as you said, kind of uh, concertinaing them into a family setting, saying, "Look, this is what you need to do." Whereas there is a state that can exist, which it actually allows that to flourish. Mm. Uh, you know, Still sounds pretty neoliberal. My... I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> because it's like um, because this is the movement toward what the state is becoming now, right? Increasingly, the state doesn't actually do anything. So that's actually why you want a state, right? You want it to be able to mobilize enormous amounts of resources that are very difficult for like an individual entrepreneur to, you know, you want a state that builds bridges, maybe has an army, I don't know, controversially, but let's just say something that is, you wouldn't want a private contractor to be up doing, right? Big things. And increasingly the state has, doesn't do that anymore. Instead it plays a regulatory function. So this seems to me to be very much in keeping with um, the kind of trajectory of the state where it doesn't do those kind of big things. Instead, it has a regulatory function and it just writes up all these rules and frameworks within which people are supposed to live their lives and do things themselves. How, is that just... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I want to give I Ollie a chance to say the the get, have the last word. Ashley, Sorry. I'm going to come in as an as a Stalinist here. We're at an hour, um, so so it's Ollie, fine. go ahead. Would um, uh, I think that there's that's a really really interesting point. But I guess would universal basic income, for example, is that a neoliberal policy? Yeah, probably it could be, or and it could actually. It's here's the thing. There's a line between neoliberalism as a misnomer. And it being actually something like post-liberalism, because mm. it's not it because post-liberalism signifies the death of that liberal project, um, and instead it's it's like um, it's the project of the not the autonomous subject, but the subject that is um, that isn't freed, but instead seeks care, safety, mm. right to life, um, and within that autonomy is a little bit dangerous. So you have like a certain amount of protection and that's like the goal. I don't know. Mm. But also like, like, um, sorry, we're, we're running out of yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like a <laughs> failure as a Stalinist. Go ahead, Ali. <laughs> sorry. That's one of the things, like, you know, universal basic income or universal basic services. I think these are sort of some of the things that a lot of the, you know, the anarchists and the mutual aid people and the various, uh, you know, uh, marginal communes and everything, if they want, the, if, you know, the, want the state to do it's like that's what it should be they should be by the platform and which every you know then the the creativity and the, and the love and the care of of neighborhoods and local communities and mutual aid networks can actually make life uh more bearable for everybody and i think that there, there is a sense that that's you know that's kind of what the the, the state is needed for and then eventually it can kind of refine that and i don't know it, it, become a sort of slightly more of a an anarchist state i don't know but there's there's a sense that i th th there is a genuine sense that that the state doesn't need to sort of create that those structures and you're right that, that dangerously there is danger that it can slip into a sort of uh, you know the, the neoliberal subject but that's kind of where i am and i think where the research i've done recently anyway that's what it bears out listen ollie thank you very much again for coming on um uh i i wanted to uh, remind everyone that you've written for Sublation Magazine. I, I hope that you will write again for us. Um, yes, I'd love to. Yes. Yeah. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out to everyone is that today, as soon as I'm done with these streams, I'm going to be posting a, a, an essay by Savoy Zizek. Um, so that will be coming up today on Sublation Magazine. Um, it is about uh, 
shit coffee, literally coffee that is shit out of uh, some sort of muskrat or something. No, yeah, it's a and, goat, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I don't know, but and 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 Putin in Ukraine, and so it's very classic. Um, I think it's remembered for all time as like definitive Zizek, and so people should check that out. Um, in just a few, like in about fifteen minutes or so. We're going to be starting a Parrot Room stream for patrons only. Um, so I want to encourage everyone who's watching this now to go and give us money. Um, we are entrepreneurial, neoliberal subjects, and uh, we need your support. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to end it there. I'm going to go out, as always, with the um, same intro, outro. But uh, Thank you someday. so much, Ollie. That was brilliant. Thank you. It was so great having you. Yeah, in the case of nuclear or radiological